Monty. Hey, Adam. How are you? Good, Monty. How are you doing? Good. Good. Well, we have a nice, clean connection, it sounds like. This is great. Thank you. Uh, thanks for doing this with me. I, I, it, it sounds from when I, what I pick up is you're seem to be constantly in demand to do this type of thing. It seems to be. I, it, it's hard to uh, kind of uh, kind of pick and choose, but I'm doing my best. Well, you are because you chose mine. So. That... <laughs> 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 exactly. <laughs> no, I really do appreciate it. So, and you know, th- and then there's that other part, which is you you <laughs> you have to repeat, often probably repeat stories. So it's all it's all the more appreciated. So, uh, what w- what's going on recently? Are you? Uh, I guess uh, the first question I guess would be: uh, uh, Are you c- currently working on something new? And and uh, I know you're also teaching uh, as well, right? Well, I'm, I'm not uh, technically teaching now. I, I'm no okay. longer teaching at Cal Arts, and I have a, a class in my home that's kind of like, uh, uh, I don't know, it's morphed into uh, just a weekly uh, movie club, uh, you know. So I'm, I, 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 it's the same students for like four years, so I figure right. I, if, if I do teach anything at all, whatever it was, it, it's long been assimilated, so we don't even try. I see. They don't get credits necessarily, in other words, but they get the, but but they get fed and they get a, a great discussion after the movie. Whatever, yeah, we 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 have fun. Yeah, you, do you still see things with the sim with the same level of enthusiasm? Or, I'm assuming that you are a movie lover, uh, as well as a filmmaker. But well, I I uh, I actually am very encouraged. I've been uh, the last. Uh... I guess a couple of months uh, I've been on the uh, Foreign Language Film Committee uh, at, at the Academy. I see. 30, 30 movies uh, so far, and uh, uh, the the movies this year seem to be so much better than ever before that uh, I, uh, I see uh, whoever's predicting the death of uh, the medium, I think, is uh, is at least premature. Glad you said that. Yeah, it seems like those folks are. I don't. I've never actually met one of them, but they, they were out there apparently because people reference them all the time, or they come up in articles. But I agree. Did you see Ida? Is that one of the ones? Or which country oh. is that? That uh, Pol- He's Polish. That was the one with the with the nun who finds out she's Jewish. It's a great film. I really hope you get to see it. I think it's the. I think it's Poland's. You know, it's their submission. You know. I've been going every night, but they also have screenings on Saturday and Sunday mornings, and I, uh, I, that's beyond my capability, so I don't go on Saturday and Sunday. I see. Anything else? Any any of the ones you did see that you thought were was? I mean, it sounded like you were excited about. Them. There's about uh, I don't know six or eight that I'm really excited about. I can't talk about them because uh, sure. Oh yeah, of course not. Voting stage, but right, uh, right, right. really some really exciting stuff out there, and. Uh, uh, I, I'm going to see uh, Winter Sleep tonight, uh, which was also included, but I missed the screening, so I'm going to catch that tonight. Nuri Bilgay Jalan, right? That's the Turkish filmmaker. Yeah, I I actually I don't know how to I actually, his middle name. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think it's Bilgay. I, I I no matter how much I studied it, when I met, I didn't meet him and got to chat with him for a little bit. But I still managed to butcher his name, even though I really practiced. I get the last minute kind of nerves or something, you know. Thank God you have a, thank God you have a more traditional name. I appreciate. It. You know, I just use hi there, you know. So when you were young, I mean, when you were starting off, I guess um, I do have to. I, I just don't know that part of your life at all. And if you don't mind, if you're willing to talk a little bit about like who, how you found your way to filmmaking in the first place, uh, I did, were you a fan of movies growing up as a young boy or i was uh excited about just just going to the theater whether it was magic shows or you know musicals or or theater or film it was all the same to me it was the i guess it's like uh olmi's uh just fascination with the curtain and what's behind the curtain you know yeah and when the lights go down it's sort of a sacrosanct kind of experience yeah, exactly. I remember having that experience too when I was a kid. I, I saw a lot of magic, and I saw you know 
also lots of uh, Saturday afternoon uh, serials, you know, 13 parters. Sure. Um, where where would that have been? Uh, in Los Angeles. You grew up in L.A. I grew up in L.A. Wow. So you and you have you been you've been basically uh, you've been based there for pretty much your whole life and. Yeah, I mean, I've I've made you know at least fifty percent, probably seventy five percent of my movies uh, away from here. But right. I think I can't even. I, I besides Silent Night, I don't know what anything else I've shot here. <laughs> so yeah, no, I. I uh, I've spent long periods of time other places. I, I spent, uh, you know, I guess, uh, you know, well over a half a year uh, off and on in Hong Kong. I've spent uh, probably close to a year in Italy working mm-hmm. on movies and uh, just, you know, all over the place. What year, roughly what period of time were you in Italy? Uh, well, I was in Italy when I made uh, uh, China 9, uh, except for the periods when we were shooting in Spain. And I was in Italy uh, with, uh, uh, I guess, Iguana. Right, yeah, I was going to ask. And also in periods so, when I was prepping. I was prepping uh, uh, the two faces of January in Italy, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. I never shot. What happened? Uh, just f- financing fell yeah, through. that's what I thought. Money. It usually comes down to that, doesn't it? It's always the money, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. You asked me what I was doing now, and I've been more actually, it's not a, not... I, calling it current is kind of inaccurate because I've been working on it for years. But uh, uh, my daughter's producing a movie for me now called Love or Die, and uh, it's uh, you know the money keeps coming and going, and we're getting closer and closer all the time. But we still don't have a go. This is for the, just the, the production, right? The production. Would you raise just enough for production, then then do it, and then worry about post production afterward, or? Uh, you can't because, because you can't raise money that way. Uh, I, I just one of my possible uh, European partners was complaining about all the Americans. They always want all the money there first, you know. Uh, <laughs> and yeah. so in Europe, I guess they can get away with you know starting a picture when they've got a little bit of money. It doesn't work here because when you raise money, people want to guarantee that you're going to finish the movie. Right. Two different worlds. And in Italy, when you were working. Uh, uh, the actors uh, would refuse to begin the next week's work until they had until they got paid for the previous week. You know that kind of thing. Uh, and has it has it been that way pretty much the whole way through? I mean, you made a, um, a number of studio films um, or films with the studio financing you, or never. The only studio film was Tulane Blackdown. Yeah, and that was the best experience working, and of course the worst experience <laughs> with distribution. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, Think that would be the best with distribution, but they just they just didn't like the movie and they and they refused to carry the ball. So, uh, but uh, no, it was a, it was a great experience uh, making the movie and uh, and uh, not so great with some of the other with some of the ind- so-called independent uh, pictures because uh, you know you, you you never know what you're going to get. The studio, you know what you have, right. and, and they part of our deal was that they left us alone and that we had final cut. Uh, but uh, you know, a lot of my independent uh, producers uh, would take the movie away from me and try to uh, recut it and so forth. And I've been fortunate because all my movies have been restored at one point or another. And I appreciate that you encouraged me to uh, watch the two, as they call them, acid westerns. Yeah, I don't know uh, what that means even. <laughs> I don't either... Maybe the director was on on the stuff at the time, or the audience are expected to be on the stuff during it. When they hear the hear uh, anything related to the '60s, they they just assume that everybody was stoned and and uh, that it was uh, you know an experience to be had only in the same condition. You know. I, yeah, I mean, having have you know they were marketed that way when I remember looking it at looking that looking it up. You know, before I got my copy. Of this Criterion package, which includes both *Bride in the Whirlwind* and the, shoot, me, the shooting, I found them so traditional in structure and in style. You know, I mean, that I was kind of surprised. I mean, I, you know, I find some of the spaghetti westerns more like acid westerns, or what I would think of them. Yeah, well, it's certainly different. Uh, uh, I don't even know why they even compare them to spaghetti westerns, but the uh, uh, our intent uh, was against what we were hired to do, which was to make a couple of B-movies, 
we always thought we were making A type movies, and and our, and our our models were movies like uh, the wonderful uh, uh, Gregory Peck uh, Gunfighter uh, mm-hmm. we saw the other day, and uh, that was that was our our intent. And of course, that's what upset uh, everybody after the fact because it was it was like that. You know, A movies were not. Like B movies, uh, there were a lot of B westerns, of course, and but we we were trying to make an A western, and uh, you know, disappointed uh, all concerned as a result. Well, I, I'm still, I guess, I never quite even figured that out. Uh, what makes a movie a B movie? You know, I understand it was the second movie, maybe after the feature or something of like that, or before the feature, but maybe because Jack Nicholson, who was your partner, I know your producing partner at the time maybe he wasn't a star yet i mean so there was no star in it was that what what why they considered a b movie the b movies w- were traditionally just a lot of action and uh, a movies were were more contemplative i guess you know oh is that right if you take the if you take the gunfighter as an example uh you know that's that's not a traditional shoot 'em up western but it even even though it has a lot of uh Good action in it. Yeah, I, I see now because it was more like serial, like like they in the old serials, as you described as a boy, seeing where they would have you know Flash Gordon or some sort of western or science fiction type thing, right? Right. But any, anyway, the you know there was there were lots of uh, you know Republic was the studio that that churned them out, and uh, I don't I can't even think of the names of any, but uh, it was it was you know the more you got at that time, the studios mm-hmm. were interested in putting out some kind of quality. They took uh, pride in some of their work. They wanted to win awards. That doesn't exist anymore because it, there is no person at a studio. It's it's a, a corporation uh, that is yeah. only interested in, in uh, you know, a product uh, the- like their whiskey or whatever else they sell, you know. Um, it's hard not to be cynical, you know, as much as you might love the art of film and the and the and the experience of filmmaking but it's hard not to be cynical you know because you can't escape the business side at all what's happened to me is uh, uh this year we, you know watching all these uh, terrific foreign movies uh i have almost zero interest in the hollywood output yes i i i, I saw rick linkletter's uh boyhood yeah boyhood i saw that and uh there are a few others that I'm looking forward to, but you know, compared to the uh, now, granted, what we're seeing from all these countries is what they consider their best, and sometimes it's a political decision, and sometimes the movies aren't so good. But right, most right. of them are, are, are really terrific. Well, I guess if we did the same here, if we only submitted our five best pictures, but that's that's not what happens. What happens is you get. Uh, you know, maybe 15 or 20 movies that are touted for Academy Awards, and most of them are crap usually. Mm-hmm. I mean, you might, you're lucky if you get one or two good movies a year. And movies out of our large uh, country compared to, you know, one or two good movies out of uh, uh, Italy or Spain or, or, or Scandinavia, it's like we, we should produce ten times more by just by, you know, in terms of our population over there is... No, absolutely true. Well, we do make a lot of good movies, but they're not market. They don't have any marketing budget, so and they're lucky if they can afford to self-exhibit and all that. So we don't see a lot of those movies, or they're dismissed, you know, from the start because they're just considered low budget and not. They don't meet all the standards for consideration. There are some good ones, but I. But by and large, uh, even with what I've said about the Hollywood product. Generally, I I go to see more of that than the other because I I've been disappointed less, or maybe because I choose I know how to choose better. But uh, I'm not a bit, you know. First of all, there's what they call independent doesn't really mean anything anymore because frequently right. they're arms of uh, the studios. They're they're a division of uh, of Fox Fox Searchlight or Sony Pictures Classics, what have you. Exactly, Magnolia. Exactly. Maybe the maybe that's an exception, Magnolia. But yeah, Sony Sony Classics has a lot of product. They 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 put out a lot, and some of it's good, you know. But but just because it's you know, so called independent doesn't make it, you know. My my favorite movies are the Hollywood movies from the last few years. 
have not been the uh, the uh, that division. They've been, uh, you know, I like uh, Skyfall and I like uh, mm-hmm. the um, Ridley Scott movie uh, Counselor. Oh right, yes, yeah, yeah. Well, you, have you heard of this new expression, which I I haven't actually had the opportunity to use yet, but it's called indie wood films, which are these sort of you know uh, movies as I think you're describing them, which are kind of independently spirited, but they're you know financed uh, by studios. But maybe a, like a film like Her or you know anything with Scarlett Johansson, maybe I don't know, or Bill Murray or uh, very few of those that I go see, uh, uh, just because I've I've been disappointed too many times. Understood. Fool me once, right? <laughs> exactly. Well, I'll, go, I'll, go, I'll go see anything Woody Allen makes. I've only been disappointed once. The only Woody Allen movie I didn't like was uh, Blue, whatever, you know, Jasmine. You didn't like that one? You you didn't like it despite Kate Blanchett's performance or it, because of her? Uh, well, you know, I won't say because of it, but I, mean, it, I, I did not like the performance. And I didn't like uh, the, the, the movie. Uh, but I love... What do you call it? Uh, the strange. Uh, you, you will meet it. one day. You'll meet a stranger. Whatever it's called. Oh, one. It, what, you know, tar, doll, dark hands. Yeah, and uh, no, there was a, a, a bunch of them over there in the last few years that were quite connected again with the audiences. You know, just yeah, shows. I'm not as crazy about them as as I am about the tall dark stranger, but uh, mm-hmm. I still, you know, I'll go see them. I'll go and I, I go see everything of his, but I and I enjoy them most of the time. Uh, the one in Rome was, you know, you know, probably the the, the least enjoyable for me, uh, but not as bad as as Blue Jasmine. Um, in that one, yeah, I don't know. I just i i found i found her performance kind of scary, but I don't, you know, like just that it reminded me, I guess, of somebody who's teetering on the brink of of madness and how it could happen. And you know, like she was, I, she convinced me in that regard. But the more you pick apart the logic of the most of the characters and the behavior of the people in the movie, just a lot of it just didn't make much sense. Well, I mean, and but, some things are just really just bad, like the dentist stuff, you know. But I mean, I, yeah. I thought that you know she has become, you know, like some other actors, uh, uh, where she's trying to outdo herself all the time, and it just becomes you're watching a performance. I don't want to. My favorite performance, so called, which is not a performance, is the little kid in in uh, in yeah, L R. And now I'm blanking on his last name, but his first name is like it's. L, I only know because that to me yeah. is the Academy Award performance of the year. He won't even, probably won't even be nominated. You know. No, no, no. Yeah, but I know his something about his lack of self consciousness. You know, and his performance was just so natural, and he just had this utterly timeless expression on his face most of the time. I, I was so um, impressed by him. He reminded me of Dennis Wilson in Tulane Blacktop. Dennis mm-hmm. was completely unaware of the camera. He would just completely forget that we were making a movie, and he would get engrossed in what was happening around him, particularly the other people who were who were talking or whatever. And he would just get this look on his face of fascination. You know, he just... He, his jaw would drop. He, he, he didn't know what he was doing. He had no awareness of himself. And that's wonderful. I mean, I was, I've never experienced that. Well, this kid is, is, is similar. You're right, because he, is, uh, he doesn't have any obligation to do anything. Mm-hmm. Rick is an amazing director because he, he recognizes that the worst thing you can do is tell an actor to do something because it's immediately becomes artificial and so he he had he felt no obligation to react in any particular way he just reacted the way he would react and that was was what was great about it you know and of course there were so many opportunities in that in that particular film boyhood for the film just to collapse i mean let alone just at any point any of the kit the either well i guess the 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 daughter character was it was his link later's daughter so Obviously, that was a bit different. But at any moment, Eller, you know, the the boy could have been either decided not he wasn't into it anymore, or his parents could have decided that you know, or they could have moved, whatever. You know, it's just it's just kind of a, one of those lucky things, considering it was an experiment. He probably would have followed him, but uh, I would hope so. And the kid could have developed into any um, a number of different ways. He could have become a druggie or all kinds of things. 
and then that would have been the movie. It would have been a different movie. You mentioned uh, Dennis Wilson's performance, and uh, other than when he wasn't accidentally backing into crowds uh, in 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 the uh, in the, in the car, James Taylor seems like he was. Seems like he was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I think I read somewhere that he 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 didn't realize the car was in reverse at one point. Yeah, well, the the, the car would be set in a particular either in forward, you know, with th- those cars, those engines, they. You know, you just kind of take your foot off the uh, uh, the clutch and it, it goes. But uh, he uh, he didn't realize it was in reverse, and he almost you know killed me and a few other people. Um, but, and what was it like working with him? He was great. But he he was the exact opposite of Dennis in that he was all, he always knew what was going on. Okay, he's a control freak. Even then, even then, he he uh, uh, was really really disturbed by the fact that he had to relinquish some control to uh, a director. Uh, but he was great. He was, he was, he was very professional. He was very, uh, he did, he did his work and more. He knew every, everybody else's job as well as his own. Wow. When, when I was doing my, uh, well, look, I'll call it due diligence, I put on the Criterion collection version of Tulane as well, and I listened to the audio commentary with you and Allison Anders, and she was really obviously very impressed by, you know, both their performances and spoke of them in a really, really well, um, you know, I think there was a scene where, for instance, where, you know, James Taylor hears Dennis Hopper and, um, oops, I'm forgetting the actress's name now, the girl, as she's called, but they're in the motel room. Go ahead. Oh, not Dennis. Right. Not Dennis Wilson. You oh, mean? Excuse me, Dennis Wilson. Yes, thank you. That would make, that makes much more sense. <laughs> um, anyway, they're in the motel. He's like on the outside, and I guess he hears them, and you know, he just sort of stands there silently. But there's one of those back back performances, you know, where you can just you get a kind of a whole performance from somebody whose back is to the camera. Yeah, you no, know, J- James was wonderful, and uh, and. You know, some of my favorite, one of my favorite moments is when uh, they're setting up the race in the gas station uh, with uh, Warren. Yes. Oh, yeah. Leans oh, down yes. to talk yes. to Laurie in the car, and the the wind is kind of blowing his hair. And he, he, that was just such a, a great moment because he just relished the idea of, of sucking this guy into a race, you know. That, is that about the time where he he keeps putting the coke bottle back into the rack and taking it out and taking another draw? Yeah, yeah, that's the same. Yeah, thing. another draw from the coke bottle, right? He, yeah. I mean, honestly, I could talk about I, what I don't know. It seems like everybody just has come around to Warren Oates over and over, and you just had a did you just seem to have a knack for uh, partnering up with and creating relationships with these incredibly talented, probably way underappreciated people at the time. I mean, I don't know. If, if Jack Nicholson was still kind of making B movies right through your two westerns, right, and then like right after that, I guess made Easy Rider and all the, of course, subsequent films with Bob Rafelson and Easy Rider was was uh, four years after the westerns. Yeah, so uh, there was no indication that that it it sounds almost like he was trying to make it in in the on the industry side as much as he was on the on the acting side, Jack Nicholson at the time because he was producing with you, right? Well, he produced with me because I invited him to, but uh, he was uh, uh, he was writing. You know, he was he was uh, yeah. uh, again at, at at my invitation. But he wrote two scripts for me within a year, and mm-hmm. uh, he had written one before that. And I guess he continued to write a little bit after that, but not for, not very much. Uh, but uh, he, uh, you know, Jack is you know. Super intelligent and uh, and uh, you know super talented in so many ways that uh, he could, he could have had any one of a number of careers uh, in in the movie business. Um, I guess my question um, is maybe around the time where you said there were four years between the westerns and Easy Rider, uh, but uh, did did you make a conscious decision to change, or did you think you were changing your style of storytelling at all? Um, into the next segment of your career, uh, which did produce, let's say, Two Lane Blacktop, Cockfighter, et- and other films. I'm just wondering, because even Jack, who uh, had been making uh, these B-movies, whether they turn out to be B-movies or not, uh, and then 
there was, of course, again, the seminal movie, that, uh, the, which is uh, Easy Rider. And then he went into Five, five Easy Pieces and Carnal Knowledge uh, and, and, and these types of much more personal films. Was that something that you thought you, you, you saw as uh, something you wanted to do as well? I, I didn't think about any of those things. You know, I never, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, kids today who are starting out making movies, uh, there's a word that's that's kind of universally part of their language, uh, which is career. It was not a word that was in our vocabulary then. We didn't think about it. We, we, we just hoped we would we always, you know, any time we made a movie, we would hope that we could make another one. Uh, but the idea mm-hmm. of a continuity uh, into something called a career did, didn't. It was never uh, anything we we were aware of or thought about in any way. Uh, maybe if we had, we might have taken different uh, trajectories. But uh, but we just we didn't. We didn't think about uh, it. Well, it's interesting because I guess Roger Corman had a career, didn't he? And yeah, um, I don't know if he thought about it either. Roger Corman had a business. I don't think he ever thought of himself as a filmmaker. Because, I mean, you ha- you had to have been, I don't know, there must have been a lot of filmmakers that were on your radar, like uh, whether it was John Ford or Howard Hawks or, uh, I don't know, uh, whatever, whatever, whatever other, you know, filmmaker. They had careers, and they were not that far away from you geographically at the time in terms of where you were living. So I'm just wondering if... I, just, I never even thought about them as people, you know, the, the idea yeah. of, of following a filmmaker's career or whatever, I just thought about movies. Uh, yeah. And so when we were making the westerns, there were half a dozen movies that were our models. You know, I mean, I, I thought about uh, The Virginian uh, with Gary mm-hmm. Cooper. I thought about Stagecoach. I thought about Shane. You already mentioned uh, Gunfight, Gunfighter. What would, no, what's the one? Uh, Gunfight, Gunfighter. What would, no, what's the one? Gunfighter, my darling yeah. Clementine. You know, I don't know how yeah. many how many uh, Ford movies there are. Maybe two in there, and uh, you know, uh, Henry King and uh, uh, William Wyler. I don't. I even. I didn't even think about the names of the directors. They were the movies that I liked. Hmm. It's, it's interesting. I think a lot of filmmakers are in the same. At least in you know, in the East Coast, certainly they're in the same boat, and they, you know, they're they're always trying just to make the next movie and but of course they're all working their asses off working day jobs or night jobs or part-time jobs or what have you you know and uh just to make a living you know because they're not making it on the films it's just the pure love and passion for the filmmaking which drives them but they're kind of i don't think anything's really changed i guess no no this idea of of uh, of, uh the auteur theory i think came out at about the same time as we were making the westerns, and so, you know, at a certain point, obviously, I became aware of that idea and began thinking about uh, other directors in terms of their uh, body of work and so forth. But at, at that time, it, there there wasn't enough from any one director that that we were would be influenced by that would make us think mm-hmm. in those terms. But as the studio system was dying and then there was that wave of that was probably part in part um, influenced by the, the uh, European auteurs, you know, and I'm referring, of course, specifically to the uh, Brian De Palma's and Martin Scorsese's and Francis Coppola's and all those guys. Um, they started making careers. It took a little while, I guess, right, until well into the 70s. But, well, I'm, but not saying that people, I'm not saying that I didn't ultimately have uh, what you call a career but it was, yeah. it was it was just it just came about i didn't i didn't predict it or try to achieve it in any way because I, it just didn't yeah. occur to me not that i not yeah. that it's not a good idea i think people today <laughs> that, that take more control of their so-called careers uh, are probably better off but uh, you know uh, but in some ways and in, in some ways not like actors who would do all, you know all kinds of parts in the old days. Now would say, well, what's that going to do to my career? You know, should I play a bad guy or should I play an unpleasant person or whatever? You know, and uh, at, at that time, fortunately, nobody thought about it. I guess uh, for the last section here, I just wanted to I wondered if you had uh, 
if you were stayed on top of sort of the stories about or the trends of distribution and if you have thoughts about how people are watching films these days, you know, so many, there's a lot of theaters, uh, theater owners rather, are threatened by day and date on demand digital platforms like, you know, now iTunes and Amazon uh, 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 screening films around the same time. And is this any of this matter to you? Do you think about it or care about it? Do you think of it, it matters that much? Uh, I do think it matters uh, in the sense that those other platforms are not paying the cost of making movies. And so uh, where uh, a few years ago you could make a, a small movie and uh, at least break even from uh, mm -hmm. the video market, uh, mm -hmm. it's been almost wiped out by the other, which doesn't pay. And so uh, a picture that, that you know, would have been okay uh, then... Uh, loses money now, and therefore, the worst part of it is, then the, the, the director uh, can't raise money for his next picture because there's no, there's no uh, avenue. Right. They're lucky, in other words, if, if a filmmaker is lucky or the producers are lucky if they get even their return back, if they can pay back their investors, let alone raise any kind of money to make another film. So they have to start all over again. Well, that's, not, that, that, that's, the, that's the point. You, know, you don't... You don't make another movie no. with the return from the first one, but the first one does well. That encourages investors to invest in the next one. And so when they see that that these other uh, forms of distribution aren't paying, uh, so just as, as an example, we haven't seen anything from uh, VOD or, or streaming uh, on Road to Nowhere. It, it mm -hmm. just returns nothing. Road to Nowhere. Mm -hmm. It may give it may it may it may give a few pennies to the uh, distributor, but not to the investor because the distributor takes his so money. So I wonder if we're just in a uh, in this uh, transitional period that's taken a long time before we kind of figure it out. Because how will this sustain itself for decades at this rate? You know, I don't see do you... any 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 sign at this point. What what it's, what's happened is that the. Uh, the studios are, are, are surviving because they make money on distribution, uh, so it doesn't matter if the pictures make money. But the uh, independents have been actually consciously wiped out. Uh, when the when the uh, the studios took control over uh, DVD distribution through what what do they, they call the red boxes or something? Mm -hmm. There's no room for small movies in those boxes. You cannot find independent movies there it's only so they they wiped out blockbuster they wiped out any other means of uh, reasonable distribution of uh, independent movies and so it's a it's a lo losing game now you the independent uh, producers directors uh, don't have any way to make their movies but anymore. you're making you're going into uh, a, 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 as you mentioned making a film and your your daughter is producer she is having problems yeah. because of what finding, we're talking finding, about finding they want to see where what's what's the uh business plan how 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 can we re mm -hmm. you know recoup our investment and you, you show them all these things that exist and they there's no recoupment and and there. and then uh and what do you make of uh another tool that seems to be very popular in the last five six years which is uh now crowdsource fundraising where you go to mo your all your friends try to get money from them uh, through like a Kickstarter or Indiegogo or a few of the other. It's fine if you're able to make a movie for fifty thousand dollars. I've seen gotcha. I've seen some some movies financed that way. Uh, I guess uh, Spike Lee financed a more expensive movie, but he's Spike Lee. You see? Right. But I, I don't know anybody else who's been able to to raise uh, more than a very small amount of money. We haven't even tried to do it through Kickstarter because. Uh, you know, with I figure I've got five thousand so-called uh, friends out there. So if they each put in ten dollars, that's fifty thousand dollars. If they put in a hundred dollars, that's five hundred thousand dollars. The movie I want to make now can't be made for five hundred thousand dollars. Right? Are you trying to get a, a at least one celebrity in there, celebrity actor, famous like you know, name in order to help raise? You know, I have you have 
uh, maybe famous names, but not necessarily bankable names. Yeah. Bankable names. Yeah, there's a handful. There's a lot of good actors out there that are that are well known, but they still don't get your movie financed. Right. Well, I'm I'm going to pull for you and and keep you like your name out going at least on my little my little thing my little dog and pony show that I'm doing here and because uh, uh, you mean a lot to a lot of people that I know. And fortunately, one good thing about there are still companies like Criterion and a few others that that keep your films and they seem to keep taking more of your films and and creating new prints and finding an audience for it. I assume that, relatively speaking, I know the Tulane uh, DVD did fairly well, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming. Uh, I think that you know, my, my movies are doing really well uh, with Criterion. Yeah. They're, they've done an amazing job. But I started talking to them uh, about doing the Westerns 10 years ago. My God. They were, they were interested. It wasn't I had to talk them into it. But it takes them a long time. They have so many great movies out there sure, sure, that they sure. want to do, and they, by the time they start scheduling something, until the time they actually uh, put it out there, it can be, you know, five or six years. It's uh, yeah. God love them. I think I think they're just they're fantastic. There's nobody else that's doing what they're doing. But, uh, but none of us are getting any younger, as they say, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, well, I, I yeah, am, yeah. but I'm, I'm, I'm the only one, you know. I, you are. You sound You sound great. Uh, I plan, I, you know, I think, thanks to Stephen Wright with this line, but I, you know, I plan on living forever and so far so good, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, or as Woody Allen said, I don't, I don't fear death. I just don't want to be in the room when it happens. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, do you get east at all, or do you come to New York frequent, in, 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 with any? Regularity or uh, not unless absolutely necessary. Understood. Yeah. I understand. Well, right now I'm sitting in a car in Brooklyn and it's snowing, so stay where you are. <laughs> oh my God! No, I, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I had yeah. a good time when I came back for the Lincoln Center uh, premiere of right. the Road to Nowhere, and and that was that was really great. But I, I literally, uh, you know, didn't have to do anything. I could, you know, a car would come and pick me up and uh, drive me around and. I didn't understood out into the cruel world of uh of... <laughs> I'm, I'm not a city i'm not a city person in general uh, yeah. uh of all the big cities new york is is the is the most city like and, and therefore the ones i like the least i see yeah you're more of the the sleepy back roads i'm a, I'm a country boy i'm a country boy. got it okay um about la because you you can yeah. I, I live in the country literally seven minutes from the Sunset Strip, so it's great. That is. No, it's fantastic. I, um, I'm going to take advantage of, of your uh, guest house one of these days and, you know, when I get out there. and and, and it's, it's actually, uh, it's two different rooms in my house. Uh, oh, okay. And people come here and, uh, and hang out, and uh, we have a great time. Yeah. We're referring to a B- Airbnb, which you're... you're yeah. Yeah, it's great. Uh, no, it's I, I I'm, I'm serious. I can't wait to do it. Well, I I, I, I well, you give me a lot of your time already, and um, you know I I sort of did the medium length version because I want to respect your time and and it, it's it was terrific. I'm, and I'm glad we got to talk about the industry a little bit too, um, because I I really was interested in your opinions coming from your background and all. So thank you. So thanks thanks so much, Monty. Appreciate it. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Take care. You too. 